Hi everyone, my name is uh, Lisman Kaspi. I welcome you all to this um, uh, inaugural um, session of, of a series of, uh, of seminars that we'll be conducting um, uh, with this semester. Um, uh, you know, it's about new liberal heritage scapes, culture and urbanism in post-conflict cities, sponsored by Stanford Global Studies. Uh, for this particular inaugural session, uh, we're collaborating with Central for South Asia at Stanford, and we are very uh, delighted to have um, you know, worked with um, uh, Anna Piklu, Lalita, and we are grateful to our organizers, Shandana and uh, Shubhangni Gupta, who have um, um, you know, done a great deal of work to, to put together this um, seminar series. The series itself is about bringing into dialogue the relationship between heritageization, transpose, and economies and urban struggles in selected post-conflict and post-conflict cities around the globe. Uh, the idea is to bring into question the problems, the problems of history, culture, economic development, uh, old, new urban aesthetics, real estate values, housing struggles, gentrification, ghettoization, a lot of other uh, aspects of, um, of, of, you know, of urban development in, in post-conflict, post-colonial cities. And throughout the cities, we will be looking at uh, different cities for for, 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 for this um, uh, inaugural session, we are focusing on Delhi and Lahore. Um, and we are delighted to have, um, you know, fantastic speakers with us, um, starting with uh, Professor Rashmi Sadana, uh, who is an associate professor of anthropology at George Mason University. And she is current, um, she's just published a, a book on, on Delhi Metro. It's called The Moving City, Scenes from the Delhi Metro and social life of infrastructure. Um, she has written extensively on, on different aspects of, um, of, of modern culture. Um, she's the co-editor of Cambridge Companion to Modern Indian Culture. Um, she's an, um, you know, an anthropologist by training um, and she is, um, has written extensively for a number of, um, of, of, you know, of, of, of different publications, uh, academic journals, popular media uh, as well. Um, and moderating this session will be uh, Professor Tom and, uh, Tom, Thomas Hansen, who is the Reliance uh, Dhirubhai Ambani Professor of Anthropology here at Stanford. Um, he's an anthropologist of critical life, ethnologist identities, violence, and urban life in South Asia and Southern Africa. Uh, those of you who are familiar with his work would know he, you know, he wrote a pioneering work on uh, the rise of, uh, of Hindutva politics in India uh, back in the 1990s uh, called the Saffron Wave democracy and Hindu nationalism in, in modern India. Um, since early 2000s, he has worked extensively in written about uh, uh, urban politics, urbanization, and, and uh, you know, um, and themes relating to that. Uh, his most recent book is about the global spread of uh, uh, popular sovereignty and the rise of illiberal democracy in, um, in, in South Asia. For our second panel, uh, which will be on, uh, on, on, on Lahore Metro, we have uh, Chris Moffat, who is a senior lecturer in the School of History, Queen Mary University uh, of, of London. Uh, he's the author of India's Revolutionary Inheritance, Politics and the Promise of uh, Bhagat Singh. And he's now currently writing a new book on architecture, politics, and the philosophy of history in, uh, in, in Pakistan. Um, with a number of, you know, um, case studies about um, about urban settlements um, and uh, architectural projects, uh, focusing on Lahore, um, and he's also co-editing a volume of essays on on Lahore's metro line, which reminds me that I have I'm supposed to submit an essay for that, and I should really be working on it. Um, moderating this session is is, is Raza uh, Raza Rumi. Uh, the man needs no introduction. You know, he's a he's a local hero. Uh, he's a Pakistani policy analyst, journalist, and an author currently uh, based at Cornell University. He has um, written extensively for, uh, for, for, for various publications. He's been associated with the uh, Jinnah Institute, a public policy think tank. Um, he's set up uh, a number of, um, um, of, of, of blogs and, and other um, you know, newspapers, including he's been the editor of uh, Daily Times, Friday Times. He's been a TV broadcaster. He's an author of a book called uh, Daily by Heart, Impressions of uh, uh, a Pakistani Traveler. Uh, so thank you, all of you. We are delighted to, to, to have you. Um, and as far as the format is concerned, uh, we'll start with uh, Rashmi and Thomas. Uh, they will uh, you know, uh, 
uh, conversation. They'll, they'll talk to each other for 40, 45 minutes, followed by uh, a 15 minute uh, question ask, um, uh, session for questions. You can type in your questions. We'll, we'll take it up um, and, um, and put it to our panelists. Um, and in the second half, um, you know, Raza and Chris will talk about Lahore Metro. So over to you, Thomas. Well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you for organizing this uh, series of events, which I look forward to. And uh, thank you, Rashmi, for um, coming here for, for with, uh, and, and being in the session. And also thank you for publishing that uh, great book. I should say um, that um, uh, this article, you published an article in 2010 it's called We Are Visioning It, which is sort of a, one of the, the, I guess, one of the first publications that came out of this project. And I've been using that in my urban studies class for many years to great effect. So um, I'm, I'm delighted that I have more material from you that I can use uh, and, 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 and in this particular class and other contexts. So uh, the book is new. It's just out. I assume that lots of people have not uh, actually uh, been able to read it. So I, maybe we, the best way to kick off a session like this would be to ask you to just give us an overview of um, some of the basic questions you basically address in your introduction. How did you come to this study? How did you get this idea? How did you do it? Uh, what's the format of the book and the sort of major uh, arguments you may say? Um, so take, take like 10 minutes or five or 10 minutes, whatever, however much time. Uh, I, if you go on for too long, I'll, <laughs> okay. I, I'll see if I can stop you, okay? Okay, Please. that sounds great. Um, first of all, thank you so much for this invitation um, and for um, the introduction and um, Thomas for, for being in, in conversation. Um, as one of the titans who writes about Indian cities, it's, it's an honor to have um, to have you as an interlocutor for, for this book of mine. Um, I, uh, as somebody, I'll just add, as somebody who did my BA and my PhD at Berkeley, I've always had a fond and respectful <laughs> relationship to Stanford and have been on campus many times over the years um, and have, have many friends from the Stanford Anthropology Program. Um, and I wish I was there in person, but um, but it's great to be with everybody here on in Zoom land. Um, okay, so this project on the Delhi Metro was my sort of second book project. My my first one had been on language politics, um, looking at Hindi and English publishers and issues of linguistic authenticity, um, and that was also a Delhi based project mostly. Um, but with this project. Um, I took on the idea of the city and the urban more directly. And I'll be honest with you, this project started in 2006 when I was still turning my dissertation into a book. And I was in Delhi doing follow-up research. Um, at the time I was a postdoc at Columbia. Um, Thomas, I think that was when I originally met you at some event at Columbia very briefly, you probably don't remember. Um, and I was in Delhi for, for a few months um, during this postdoc, and I, of course, knew about the metro. I got on the metro, and on that very first metro ride, I was, I wouldn't say I was in shock. I, I experienced what many Delhiites, the Livalas, experienced. That's what I was convinced of. I just immediately thought, oh, this is going to change everything. Um, and the reason I felt that was partly because I'd been going to Delhi since I was two years old. I knew the city really well. I knew the transport hierarchies, especially. Um, I never had a car in Delhi. I always was either in other people's cars or mostly in auto rickshaws. I used to take buses a lot. Um, I walked a ton in the city. I knew what it meant to go around the city as a woman, um, as a upper middle class woman in the Indian context, but still as a woman. Um, and getting on that metro, you know, I had been in metros in London, Paris, New York, but 
but this was different. It had um, sensorily, it was a different experience to get to go from a Delhi street into the system. Um, and also it immediately, even at the beginning when there were just three lines, it made me have a sense of, it started to make me have a sense of the city in a different way in terms of its borders, always shifting borders. And so really this project um, started with this kind of aha moment. And within a couple of years, you know, it took me a while then to get going because I was finishing another project. But basically by 2008, um, after my postdoc, I actually went to Delhi to finish my book, my first book, and I ended up staying for five years. And the second of those years, I had an AIS, the American Institute of Indian Studies uh, fellowship for this Metro project. And so even though, you know, I came up with a re way of how I was going to describe the project, um, I didn't really know how I was going to do the research because the book is also, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm going to get to what the book is about, but the book is, um, it's about the Metro, but it's also my attempt to think through what it means to do urban ethnography in a mega city in the 21st century um, and how to capture the fragmentary nature of the urban form, um, the gargantuanness of the urban form, um, but to do this ethnographically, to do this at the small scale, uh, which is what we do in anthropology and which is what I love about anthropology. And so throughout the project, I was squaring these two impulses. Um, and this really brings me to the uh, sort of framework of the book, which is that it's about infrastructure, of course, um, a major mega infrastructure, um, but there are three ways in which I'm thinking about infrastructure. One is, the first is in terms of the symbolics um, as the Metro as a symbol of modernity, globalization, um, but really, you know, thinking about what the symbolics do to people and how the symbolics intersect with their own aspirations. Um, the second is really thinking about the urban landscape. Uh, the Delhi Metro is 25% underground but 75% above ground. So one of the first things that I noticed about it was the impact it was having on the, on the urban landscape. And so this book is very much also about the physicality of the Metro, the materiality of the Metro um, linked to the idea of landscape for me is our issues of urban design, of architecture, um, of discourses on development. So in this aspect of the book, you know, you find the interviews that I did over the years with uh, urban planners, with Delhi Metro Rail Corporation officials, with bureaucrats uh, in different urban agencies in, in the city, with politicians, um, with contractors, all of those kind of people. Um, and this was really to think about uh, architecture, urban planning and, and development and, and what the Metro meant for the city in these ways. And then the third sort of prong is thinking about the Metro as a transport mechanism. And really, I would say the, the central, the core of the book is really about the social impact on, on people who ride the Metro, who live near stations. Um, and it's to really connect or find the intersections between transport mobility and social mobility. Um, what I found in my research was that in terms of social mobility, issues of gender and class came up the most um, and really became sort of the central features and themes, I would say, that, that run through the entire book. Um, in terms of the actual research that I mentioned and this sort of puzzle that I had to figure out, which was how to uh, study such an object as the Delhi Metro, this also changed because of the length of time I was able to devote to this project and the fact that I was living in India for the, for the first five years. I quickly saw that, okay, I was going to be not only studying the impact of the Metro, but studying it as each phase was being built. And so what I thought at the beginning would be 
a one year project. I had that AIS. So I thought, oh, okay, maybe my second book will come out right after my first book or very soon after. Well, it was 10 years after. Um, and that's because with each phase, the project for me took on um, a different depth. And it really, I have to say, did keep my interest um, because. Well, and this is how actually how I organized the book in terms of the chapters, which which I can say something about in a minute. But um, but the book really, or rather the Metro as it grew, um, the discourses on the Metro changed as it grew and people's experience changed because as it grew, as it grew out towards and through into Haryana and Uttar Pradesh and, you know, really getting out of Delhi into these other places, I was meeting people from Ghaziabad. I was meeting people from, you know, oftentimes, you know, almost rural areas. And I was having longer conversations because you could be sitting on that green line for 45 minutes or an hour to even get to Connaught Place. And so the nature of my research changed. The people who I was meeting was changing. I ended up dwelling a lot at the ends of the metro lines. I ended up reimagining what I thought urban and rural meant in terms of a continuum or a versus or either or binary, all these things. Um, so conceptually, the project became more interesting to me as well. It wasn't just about, okay, global emblem, mega infrastructure, transnational production. Yes, that's all there. But more interesting to me uh, started to become the ideas of the relationships between the centers and the ends of the line and what this meant in people's lives. Um, so the form of the book is unusual for an academic book, even for an anthropology book. It's not unprecedented. Um, I had read Kathleen Stewart's Ordinary Affect, so I knew that it was okay to do little short vignettes. <laughs> but I also knew that I had a different beast on my hands. Um, I had so much, so much research. Um, by the time it came to 2018, the phase three of the Metro was ending, the construction phase. And really this was, um, these three phases were the most sort of monumental. I mean, now there's a fourth phase, but it's it's a different scale. I mean, th the first three phases are really the ones that have transformed the city. So I knew that th this phase three was ending and I thought, okay, this is a good time. I need to, to think about how I'm gonna present this research, this material. Um, and I think I would say it happened somewhat organically. Um, I started to realize that the form, I wanted the form to relay my argument, not just the words. Um, I realized that I wanted the experience of reading the book to mimic um, the idea of urban fragment, but also the idea of the stops and starts of the Metro. Um, I wanted the idea of I was thinking sort of about the history of ethnography and about the idea of, of vignettes as vines. And this also made me think of the lines of the Metro as vines. And so I thought, okay, I, I you know, also I just really enjoy re writing vignettes as I think people who have read the book will, will see that I, I take great pleasure in the text. I mean, you know, from the eighties, we've had big debates about you know, anthropology as text and, and all of that. We don't really talk so much about the pleasure of the text uh, or the pleasure of writing the text. Um, so I approach this material as a writer, um, as well as a researcher. And I think those two things uh, for me had to go together. Um, and that was partly because of, even though I have critiques of the Metro, um, but I have a love of this project um, and I, I'll, I have to say, I had a hard time letting it go. But then once I started writing it, the actual book, it came quite quickly. Um, and I think that's because my concepts were able to marry my form in a way that was satisfying for me. Um, and of course, then I had to figure out, is this gonna be satisfying for other people or is this gonna be perplexing? Um, and, you know, I got very good feedback, and so I pressed ahead. Um, and so the the product is is what it is. And maybe I'll stop there <laughs> for the moment.
Okay, great. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I think that gives a, a sense of it. It's it's a it's a pleasure to read. It's very well written, and you get the the pleasure of writing it uh, comes through the pages. I think so. Um, so that's that's really uh, lovely, uh, and the range of people you meet uh, on, on those pages is really. I mean, for me, it's like it, it was a a part of the Delhi experience, as it were. Right now, I have some a couple of questions for you. Um, to kick off. Um, and one thing I want to start with is that since say, you began with that, you know, I'm, I sat on this metro for the first time and I had this thought, this is going to change everything. Now, so the question I'm interested in here first is, so what did it change and what did it not change? Yeah. Um, I mean, one thing you quote is that it, uh, the metro, even now at its fullest extension, I don't know if that figure still holds up, accounts for about 5% of all transportation in the city. So that in itself uh, begs the question of the, the, the rest of the, the 95%, right? Mm -hmm. um, so let me begin like this. Uh, you know, you remember in Tim Mitchell's great book, Colonizing Egypt, he has this uh, uh, chapter on urban planning and how uh, the kind of change in perspective you have once you put a sort of... Um, a, uh, an object that is uh, ordered in the middle of another uh, context, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the rest of it uh, appears um, as disorder, right? Mm -hmm. And it, you have this story, mm -hmm. I think it's about Silampur and the Trans Yamuna, uh, that station mm -hmm. over there, um, where you uh, have this story, people were not too happy with this uh, uh, station, at least there were some sort of voices there. So could you speak a little bit about what, because I think what the focus of some of these conversations is also really about the physical form of cities, right, what they do. So could you speak a little bit more about the effect, as it were, yeah. of this 75% of the metro, certainly some of these stations, so some of them are spectacular, some of them are not spectacular. Um, and what do they do architecturally, spatially, whatever, in those neighborhoods as they extend into the sort of ever deeper into the sort of peripheries of, of Delhi? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... Um, do, they, do they appear as, as order amidst... Do they produce this order in Mitchell's sense? That's right. the thing. So this is the thing with the Metro, um, especially the first phase was this is to get to the first part of your question about you know what did it actually change or not change for people and for communities um the truth is the metro and the delhi metro rail corporation will will say this as well um maybe in a different way but um the metro was built as a standalone project precisely because of this question of order and disorder they wanted this project to be different than other infrastructural projects in India. They wanted it to follow international standards. It had to follow international standards because it was, it was the nature of the technology. They couldn't, uh, they couldn't mess this up because you know, there would be safety disasters and issues and that kind of thing. And also they wanted, and by they, I mean the Delhi Metro Rail Corporation, um, and especially the first project manager, uh, Sridharan, who, you know, anyone who knows about the Delhi Metro knows, knows him. He was uh, basically in charge of the project and, and, and also set certain standards for how it would be built. But he came to it as an engineer and as somebody who was focused on making the Metro exactly as it had to be made, but had no interest in what was one inch out of the station. So not only was it a standalone system, it did not do the basic thing that all transport and metro systems must do. It only works if it connects to the bus, connects to you know, parking lots, connects to other forms of transport. Because of course, a metro system, especially at the beginning, doesn't go very many places. And so there was this idea that you know, we had this shiny object that yes, and people were taking joy rides like crazy, as I described my own. <laughs> And saying, okay, the speed, this velocity, velocity, this you know, feeling of um, the air conditioning. The air conditioning is fantastic. That was the main thing people talked about: um, the speed and the air conditioning. But was it actually a system that people were going to use? Um, and to this day, 
even now with 286 stations and 10 lines, um, the reason why it's only 5% of trips, it's not because it's so expensive. It is expensive for, uh, for the very poor, but they're not writing it. It's really for the working class, middle classes. Those are the sectors that are writing the Metro. Um, so that's a lot of people. I mean, 3 million people ride it a day. But you know, if you think about the geography of a city like Delhi, and all of the different places where people have to get to, even with those 286 stations, even with those 10 lines, the best way to get to all the nooks and crannies of the city is either a uh, bus or motorbike. And that's those are the two main ways after walking that people get around. And so what they were thinking, I think they thought people who drove cars would start taking the Metro. That has not really happened so much. Instead, people who are, I mean, some people who, who drive cars take the Metro or take it once in a while, but the majority of people who are taking the Metro are taking it in conjunction with an auto or a motorbike or some other, con or a bus. And what really has to happen is that there has to be much more integration between these different forms of transport for it to really take off in, in this way. I mean, if you ride the Metro, you'll say, oh, it's crowded, it's, you know, it's, it's working. And yes, it is. But in terms of really impacting traffic, I mean, that may never happen because there are something like a thousand new cars on Delhi roads every, you know, every um, week, I think it is. And, you know, the, as a form of distinction, I mean, people want cars. That's, that's what's happening, unfortunately. But that's, there's, for the moment, there doesn't seem to be much getting around that. Um, so, but you know, if you talk to those the people that ride the metro, especially that commute every day, it's completely changed the way that they interact with the city. Um, so, for many millions of people, it has changed things in a very significant way. Um, in terms of how the stations impact neighborhoods, it depends on the neighborhood. Um, in the book, I tell the story of Okla Station, whereby um, people living in the informal settlements below the line, you know, they look at the metro, and to them, it's an, an example of what the government does for rich people, but not poor people like them. Um, and it's a, you know, it's like an albatross. At the same time, they think, okay, well, if they've made this shiny object for them, you know, what are they going to do? What are they going to do for us? Maybe we can at least get some of the housing that's going to people who've who've lost their homes because of the metro. So there's this strange logic where, you know, you you're not going to ride the metro. You don't have much interest in it, but you're thinking about other infrastructures related to it that may impact you. Um, and it's it's more about what the it's more about the metro being a symbol of of the government and what it's doing and not doing. Um, in, in Defense Colony, you know, a wealthy uh, part of town, not far from Okla, just on the same line, a few stops away, um, you know, people protested against the Metro saying, we don't want it because it's above ground and people are gonna be able to look into our houses. Um, and then once they had their campaign and they weren't really listened to, but DMRC officials went to their homes and said, no, no, it'll be okay. We have soundproofing, we have international standards, which they did. And now they think of it as a mark of distinction. I mean, many of the women who I talked to in Defense Colony, they don't ride the Metro because getting to the station that one kilometer, it's, they don't wanna walk, they don't wanna take the cycle rickshaw, but they like that a city like Delhi has a Metro. So again, it's even people who are not riding the Metro, the commuters, um, they they are impacted because of the station and because of the the larger um, because of the system in their midst. People, if you talk, the, the vast majority of people I talk to of all classes and people who ride the metro and people who don't, Delhiites love the metro. <laughs> I mean, yeah. they love it. It is the lifeline. It is now the thing is they love it. They love the inside. They love that it's clean. They love that it's got surveillance. They feel safer women in the ladies coach, you know, I said, oh, isn't this, you know, uh, when the ladies coach first started, I said, well, you know, it's, it's kind of patriarchal attitudes getting transported <laughs> into the system. 
I quickly changed my own tune about that. I mean, yes, that's true. But so many women said to me, you know, my family lets me go out alone now. I can go because they know I'm going to be in the ladies coach. So that's that's mobility. That's real mobility in that case. Um, yeah. There are many hundreds, thousands of women, millions of women maybe who who feel that. Um, so, can I? Yeah. Yeah. Can I jump in here? But I have a couple of other questions. I have yeah. some more stuff about the conduct within the metro. But before we get to this, I wanted to, you have one phrase in the middle of the book where you sort of um, have a meditation on the role of infrastructure, what it does to cities and all that. And then you have this phrase, which I thought was um, interesting. You say um, that uh, infrastructure is a form of rhetoric. Mm. Uh, and the metro is also by by that token a kind of rhetoric it speaks mm. right to the city to the but what does it say mm. okay you know what it says it says look we can do this and what people are saying back to it is okay i want the rest of the city to be like this i want other infrastructures not just metro to be like this. You can do it. This is what's happened. You know, the metro has not made India world class, or not India, but the metro has not made Delhi more world class. It's that the metro is an example of world class infrastructure. And because that example is there, it gives the message that this is possible. But for many people, the metro's, you know, the metro is not enough. They want the water system to be like this and electricity and, you know, the, the infrastructures of life in a sense as well, not only transport. Um, so I think that's what it says. And I think that's how people um, respond to it. And why they love it also, so at least some people. Yeah. Yeah. For that reason. Yeah. I, I want to come to, um, before we open up, I want to come to something that takes up, I mean, you you touched on it now around gender, around the sort of mobility for women, the physical, the, the sort of affordances of the metro that it allows women to travel uh, in ways they haven't done before. The way people um, really embrace surveillance technology and all that. So, so mm -hmm. um, I was struck by, by, um, by the let's call it you know borrowing a phrase from uh, from will glover's book on lahore where he talks about urban planning as a form of pedagogical exercise he calls a materialist pedagogy right mm -hmm. the way in which physical structures instruct and work on people and shape their sensibilities and their conduct and so on um which is an old idea victorian idea mm -hmm. right so yeah. um i, I wonder what how much of this is also about um, not just the world class as a symbol, but also this sort of setting a part of the metro as a place where the codes of conduct um, are different, right? I mean, one phrase I've heard lots of people say about uh, Sweden, uh, the, the first uh, engineer, right? But also about how the, man the management of the metro is the term strict. Everything is strict, right? Yeah. The surveillance mm -hmm. is strict. The control is strict. You have to line up, queue up before you go through the, the ritual of the, the security control, mm -hmm. which you wouldn't do in any other part of the city. Um, there are certain both explicit and implicit codes of conduct in the station, how you behave. So lots of, especially the middle class people are really in love with the idea of the strict, right? Yes. Uh, and, and, but, but again, coming back to the question of what what's new and what's not new, in some ways, I mean, that's kind of part of the rhetoric of urban Indian uh, planning in South Asia since colonial times. And, you know, the sort of pedagogy teaching, disciplining the masses, you know, we had it um, examples of it during emergency. And, you know, so is there some, could you speak to that a little bit, how the sort yeah. of um, the social discipline that's sort of imposed mm -hmm. on people in this sort of space that is set apart from the rest of the city and how that's an object both of freedom and enjoyment, but also has a kind of symbolic force that reaches way back, in fact, in yeah. terms of the, how people, how uh, especially middle-class people look at the rest of the city. 
Mm -hmm. No, no, absolutely. And, and you really, um, you see it a lot in relation to what women say about the behavior of men in the metro. So yes, to, to your broader point, um, you know, people are glad for the surveillance. They're glad that people don't spit on the metro. I mean, this was the major concern actually, more than sexual harassment at the beginning was spitting. And there are some sections of the metro where people do spit, I've seen it, and there are no cameras there, so maybe that's why. Um, but people don't spit. If people started spitting on the metro the way they do on the street, in the matter of three days, that whole system would look completely different. So there is this sense that because it's a, such a controlled space, um, and it's not just the cameras. Think about Delhi. Many of you know Delhi. It's the lighting. It is so well lit. It is that those strong lights at all times of day and night, that is very different than any other place you go to in Delhi. Um, so that points to the safety discourse, but also this idea of being watched because you can be watched because of the light. And, but to go back to this point of, um, you know, matching behavior, many women I talk to and men actually, their, their main point they make about why there's no sexual harassment in the Metro is because of the class of person, okay? So it's this old trope that it's only the working class guy who is the harasser, who stares at you, who does all that. We all know, any woman who's been around Delhi knows that it's not just the working class guy, but that is the trope, okay? And so on the trains, they're like, yes, there are working class, there are poor people, there are all kinds of you know laboring class people on the train, but they know they can't behave like that. They know they can't stare. They, and that's why it's safer for women. So there's this idea that the surveillance is going to, the surveillance discourse and the safety discourse, they intersect. And yeah, you could say it's pedagogic. You could say it's, um, yeah, it, it is that. But what, what was interesting for me was in the early years before the ladies coach, because you saw many men and women sitting side by side in all the coaches. Now, even today, there are men and women in the coaches together, but you know, it's like four to one or something. And before it was just much more mixed. And I remember riding those trains thinking, wow, this is something that, you know, here we are in a Delhi public space, people are crunched together and everyone's kind of behaving <laughs> like, you know, I wasn't like people, I wasn't worried about getting harassed. I don't think other women were so much. It was a pretty different space compared to walking on the street, for sure, or being in any other public space. So I, I lamented when the ladies coach started because it did send a different message. It said, oh, the Metro is not that kind of space. It's not going to lead a way forward for you know, men and women just being more respectful uh, of each other's spaces, men especially more respectful of women since that's usually the issue. Um, so that was, I, I lamented that, I did. Even though, as I mentioned before, I'm, I'm glad that so many women who normally wouldn't go out um, on their own into the city are feel that they can because of the Metro. So yeah, the, the pedagogical aspects are, you know, are definitely there. I mean, people also are creative with the Metro, but yeah, you can't be too creative because of the, the protocols, you know, the security protocols and, and all of that. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, no, I mean, it's it's a very striking feature of, you know, mm -hmm. the way people actually uh, stand in line to get in yeah. through through the security, right? I mean, that's not the usual thing you see elsewhere in the city. Yeah. So there's something, there's a lot going on there. Um, I want to make sure we are now at 43. So we have another 15 minutes. I want to make sure that people get to ask questions. You can write in the chat. Or, uh, but this is not a webinar, right? So we could also have people ask questions directly if they want. Shubangni, Shandana. Uh, no, uh, just just to make sure, like we have all variables in place. The chat has been enabled, but uh, participants can't unmute themselves, so they can write in their questions. Okay, so you are all muted. All right, uh, that's like being in the metro. You know, like <laughs> there are some technical systems you cannot mess with here. Yeah. Um, 
All right. So um, uh, please uh, let, uh, yeah, just uh, write something if you would like uh, and ask a question. Um, so, yeah, so as, a, as a sort of follow up to that, um, uh, one, one, uh, maybe coming back to some of the things that we are talking about here in terms of, um, uh, you know, a sense of space, a sense of uh, um, what the metro has done to the way in which people experience the city. It's, it's, uh, it's opened the city in some ways, right? And you talk about the sort of joy riding in the beginning. Right, uh, especially when the first lines were opening and all that. And um, for, could you speak a little bit to that? I mean, have you have you come across that um, uh, uh, that that carries on? Or was it more a feature of novelty that when the, the, it began that people would do these joy rides? Oh, I can go to the other end. I can go to Noida without you know sitting in traffic for two hours or. I can do these things. Or was it more novelty? This kind of uh, um, mm. joy, joyful exploration of of uh, and in and who did it? Yeah. So this is the thing. It goes on. It goes on. People are still taking joy rides because as the metro grows, it's connecting to further and further out places, and so new people are discovering it all the time. At the beginning, what was most striking about the joy rides? was that for many people, it was the first time they had taken an escalator. So it, the experience really started from when they stepped into the station. The escalator, the electronic ticket gate, you know, the coach sort of came after. For some people, the coach was like, they said, oh, it's like the Indian railways, you know, different. But the escalator was more interesting for some people. Um, I still meet people who are taking joy rides on the Metro and who are doing just that, seeing, seeing how far they can get in an hour, or you know, going to a part of the city that they had never gone to before. So that idea of joy and of exploration is still there. Um, but you know, it's, yeah, the other, oh, the other thing sort of related to that is one of the reasons I also knew that it was time to wrap up my research and, and write the book was that I started meeting people who, you know, in their 20s, who didn't have a memory of Delhi before the Metro. And so that was an indicator to me. I was like, okay, this is um, not only a good time to, to wrap up the project, but also, you know, this tells me something about, okay, it's almost going to be a generation now because the Metro first opened in December, 2002. And, you know, so it's 20 years, so it makes sense. But what was interesting to me when I was doing the project, of course, was to talk to people about, you know, what was changing in the city for them and, and you know, pre-metro versus metro. Um, and then I started to see that, okay, there is a whole new generation now where this is Delhi, the metro is Delhi, and that is how they are coming to know the city. And so that was, that was kind of interesting. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I uh, Chris uh, is asking whether he could ask a question relates a bit to. Could we unmute Chris? I, I yeah. think I have the ability to. You, unmute, you have, that's okay. Oh, wow, you're empowered, Chris. Go ahead. <laughs> it was kind of related, actually, to what you're just saying in terms of how much um, there is a kind of like how much of it is about the metro. Um, inside of it in the infrastructure, experiencing the infrastructure, but how much of it is also about the views that it offers of the city. Um, so kind of spectatorship outside the windows. And I was thinking about Kadri Jane's work on automobility and the view from the windshield. And I wonder if there's also something to be said, maybe you do touch on this in the book mm -hmm. um, and haven't got to that part yet, but um, I'm thinking of, you know, I'm, I can't recall the station, but there is, um, uh, you know, a part of the Metro where you pass this kind of, the statue of Hanuman, which is kind of mm -hmm. like outside the window in a very dramatic way. And there's, you know, yeah. there's all sorts of different um, experiences of seeing the city in a new, uh, from a new angle, really. And I wonder how much that comes into the, that joy writing aspect. Yeah, I think it, I think it does. Uh, I, yeah, I just uh, before you answer, so I have three questions here. So uh, we'll see if we can do it do the, the Q and A short, so we can do it all in 12 minutes. Rashmi, go ahead. Okay, I'll, I'll do a short yeah. answer. Yeah. Um, 
yes. <laughs> I mean, yes. Uh, you know, that was something that I got, uh, I think from early on, I was interested in was how people were looking at the city differently, because they could see the city in a different way. Um, and, you know, I noticed this just for myself, as when I was riding around, I lived in Lajpat Nagar, and I would take the Violet Line out to Badarpur. And, you know, the way that you could see how things were connected in a way that you didn't see from the road. Um, and so this is, this became important to the research in terms of thinking about, um, you know, how we, you know, going back to Kevin Lynch, you know, the image of the city, how, how people were empowered in a sense to create their own image of the city and thereby their own place in it. Um, and so that became very interesting to me. And that was something I looked for um, in, in my interviews with people. So, yes. Thank you very much. So I have here from, uh, whoops, I have from uh, Ali. He is asking, I would like to know if people generally refer to metro stations with the names the Delhi government has given them or whether they have come up with their way of marking them. In either case, what does that tell us about the state's ability to write the national narrative into the urban text? Hmm. Um, people generally, from my experience, they they call the station names that are given, um, probably just because otherwise it might be confusing. Um, and yeah, the names um, are all decided on by the Delhi Metro Rail Corporation. Sometimes they've had to change the names because there's been issues people had with the names. Um, but yes, it's a very, um, you know, if you, look at the yellow line as it goes to through Gargao, there are names from, you know, Hindu mythology and, and that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, people tend to, so yes, these, I mean, as with all metro maps across the world, um, the station names are absolutely part of the urban text. And, um, and what was interesting to me as the phases grew was that people were recognizing places that had never been recognized before. And so for me, this was a way to think about how um, the malleability of urban borders um, in terms of what's considered to be part of Delhi, what's considered not to be part of Delhi and how things get absorbed um, into, in a sense, the, the idea of the urban and not only the urban text. Thank you. So uh, Anna had a question, but she was indicating that that's been answered already. Is that right? Yeah. Well, it was a question more about the mobility of the metro, whether that how that sort of um, shaped the imaginaries of places uh, people haven't seen before, but also questions of belonging to the city of Delhi, whether it has that inclusive or exclusive uh, function. Could you say a few things about this and then we'll go to yeah. Jasper. So yeah, this was always something that would surprise me to be honest. I mean, maybe not always, but often was, you know, who, who felt included and who felt excluded. I mean, sometimes it was obvious, you know, people who um, like the people in Oakla I was talking to, they, you know, they didn't have jobs to go to that the Metro would take them to. And so they felt excluded. Um, but then I would meet people at the ends of the lines coming from Rotak and, you know, places far beyond the NCR, the National Capital Region, and they had felt a claim on the city the minute they stepped into the station at the end of the line. For them, even if it was practically, a, you know, in the hinterlands and in almost a rural outpost in a way, when they stepped into the station, Delhi Ponchke, I'm in, I'm in Delhi. And, you know, maybe that was just, okay, yes, you've paid your token. And so you're, you're, and you will be in Delhi in an hour, but it was, um, you know, and these were people who, who didn't even live in the city. Um, so I thought that was quite interesting, the way ideas of inclusion and exclusion worked, um, depending on, you know, a number of factors. Thanks. So I'll go to this may have to be the last question. Uh, this is from Jasmine Reed. Uh, um, 
and she's saying during the planning phases, as you mentioned, the idea of the Metro bringing Delhi into the world-class status was a driving motivation to create the Metro. What I've found working in Johannesburg, South Africa, is that, is that officials will often draw on the examples of other cities that uh, as comparisons for what Johannesburg could be, like New York, LA, London, Lagos, and so on. Did you find certain other world-class cities coming up in the rhetoric of how officials and planners talked about the Metro? And what kind of mental geographies did these comparisons create? Yeah, absolutely. So um, many bureaucrats I spoke to, but also the main politician who was in power during the, the building of the Metro, Sheila Dixit, um, who, who I interviewed, um, you know, they had traveled uh, abroad. They had been on the London Metro. They had been on the Singapore Metro. Um, different metros depending on who it was um and so they were very much of the idea that okay we have to have this in delhi and now of course once it's happened in delhi all these other indian cities are now building them or, or even have built them um so there was this sense that okay we can we can do this now but there's there was also the you know inter-asia aspect of the metro when metro started happening in asia so again in these you know Beijing, Shanghai, Singapore, Hong Kong, these are more recent systems. Then it became even more imperative that Delhi have a metro. And the fact that the loan for the project came from the Japanese government, a lot of the engineers, architects, planners, not, not planners so much actually, but engineers and architects, they were going to Tokyo um, for training sessions and that kind of thing. And I, feature one of those stories in, in the book where, um, you know, he's an, he's an architect slash bureaucrat and he goes to Tokyo. Um, he works, he's gonna be designing metro stations and he's never been on a metro before. And so his, you know, he first goes to the Tokyo Metro and he's overwhelmed and he kind of goes back to his hotel and feeling embarrassed that he doesn't know how to deal with it, what to do there. I mean, it's also probably a language issue, right? But then his the hosts take him and he starts riding the metro and he's like you know within days we were like locals and then he said when i came back to india i saw that red line and i thought you know this this is going to be like tokyo and but then the other thought he has is but when you step out of the station it's not going to be like tokyo it's going to be back to Delhi. <laughs> and so, so he was, there was this awareness of, you know, it's kind of like what Iwa Ong talks about where you're, or it's very much like what she talks about where you're, you're having this intercity sort of um, relationship through issues of design, but also expectation and this desire to sort of uh, be like that, to copy that, but yet, you know, you're doing it in your own local way. And so, um, so yes, there were, um, there was this sense of comparison and that, you know, I mean, this is the first multi-line metro system. I know there was Calcutta, but that's 16 stations and one line. And in my opinion, one line a metro does not make, even though the issues of modernity and global emblem were, or not global, but modernity were central in that project. But this is the first multi-line metro in on the South Asian subcontinent. Um, so, so yes, these ideas of emulation um, and also, yeah, to go back to the pedagogy idea as well. I mean, they were, they were there in this project for sure, especially among the bureaucrats and people working at that level. All right. So we're coming close to the hour. I have a couple more quick questions. Maybe we can take them and then wrap up. Uh, if you go a few minutes over, that's okay. I hope, uh, so there's a, a question from Fisa Salim, uh, what kind of surveys were conducted prior to the Metro planning? What were people's perception regarding the cityscape of, uh, or the city's shape and scape um, before they began this? If you mean the, what the surveys that the Delhi Metro Rail Corporation did, I mean, they yes, did. Yes, I think so. I think that's yeah. what the question is. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the surveys, the nature of the surveys was, you know, figuring out which were the routes that were most common, right, in terms of where people worked and where people lived. But the metro lines were built along existing railway lines because the government already owned the land. So that is where a lot of the, the design and the mapping out of the metro lines um, 
that's the reasoning behind it. And then as each phase progressed, um, you know, and there were there weren't so many land disputes because the Delhi Development Authority basically just handed over the land to the to the government. The the Delhi Metro Rail Corporation is a half central government, half Delhi government operation. And that, in a sense, is the most important part of the story in terms of the larger issues of, of infrastructure in that, um, you know, that's why things got done in the way they did. And that's why there weren't holdups, um, at least for the first three phases. And that's why people got moved out of the way. Um, and, you know, so, I mean, there's more I can say about that, but, um, but yeah, I mean, the surveys were done. They did all of the surveys as well. Hmm. Thanks. Just quickly, um, Isabel wants to know if there are um, other uh, if there are people who consider the metro to be a failure, especially in view mm -hmm. or have sort of failing elements, especially in view of the fact that um, it hasn't enticed middle classes away from car transportation. It doesn't connect with other uh, forms of, of transport. So is there a kind of counter discourse to, yeah. to this kind of uh, celebration of the metro as a token of modernity and all that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I have a, a bunch of interviews in the book about that from, from key people, urban planners and activists um, in the city. And so, yeah, the, the metro, I mean, the, the counter discourse is that all of this money that went into the metro could have gone into a world-class bus rapid transit system that would have really met the needs of the majority of people. That is the counter discourse. And uh, people don't want to hear that discourse, but but it is there. Um, and one of the, the areas that I follow in the in my research and that appear in the book is what was happening to the first bus rapid transit line um, that was built around this or within the same time period as the early phases of the metro and why it was considered a disaster and why it was dismantled in the end. Um, and so it goes back to this issue of will, um, of yes, of interclass, uh, you know, um, well, yeah, with the BRT, it, you could almost describe it as class warfare, what happened. Um, people in their cars could not stomach the idea of a bus passing them on this little, you know, six kilometer stretch. Um, and so they got rid of it with the help of the police and and in the end, even the Am Admi party. But um, so yeah, the counter discourse is absolutely there. And that is running through the book as well. I mean, the book is, you know, ultimately shows the, the contradictions of, you know, a high hi-fi metro system, capital intensive mega infrastructure, the promise of that versus, um, you know, the idea of the people who it's supposed to serve and how it actually intersects and impacts their lives. So it's a book revealing those those contradictions. Thank you very much. So so we have there is one last question, but I think we should move on to the next half. So uh, I'm sorry about that, Bumika, uh, who asked an interesting question about the kind of morality of ridership and and despite surveillance and whether there is a con uh, there is a discourse about that. But maybe um, we can take that, or you can address that directly to Rashmi, or we can pick it up at the end of the session when we get to the sort of concluding session. So let's wrap it up here. Thank you so much, Rashmi, for a great uh, summary of your work and, and great answers. And thank you for, for asking the questions. Thank you so much, Thomas, for your questions. And thank you to everyone uh, for listening and also for your wonderful questions. I really, um, I really enjoyed this. And now over to uh, the next session. Shall I just dive right in, Ali? Yeah. Ali? Is, uh, is Raza here? Um, yeah, he's here. Oh, okay. Yeah. Very Thank much. You. It's over to you. Yeah. Cool. Right. Um, Thank you uh, so much, everyone. And thank you to Shandana and Shubangni for uh, organizing this, for the invitation, to Ali for, for chairing. Um, I wanted to start just by kind of uh, offering warm congratulations to Rashmi on, on the moving city, which I have been really enjoying so far. And as someone who's interested in writing about cities, but also as a kind of former 
dedicated user of the Violet line um, myself as well in Delhi. Um, so for the second half of this event, we wanted to move to a context that shares much with Delhi, um, whose longer history of urban development mirrors much of the Indian capital, but which also hosts some interesting uh, contrasts and peculiarities that Raza and I will attempt to kind of unpack, I guess. Um, and this is the context of Lahore in Pakistan. So our starting point is the new Orange Line metro system, the first of three proposed uh, rail routes, which stretches about 27 kilometers across the city um, from the Northeast to the Southwest. Uh, and for most of this route, like um, in Delhi, it takes the form of a, of a viaduct, right? It's, it's overground, it's a raised track, which now dominates the uh, urban environment that it crosses. Um, it kind of casts its shadow on the buildings and lives that, that come beneath it. Um, and the viaduct follows the, the historic Grand Trunk Road, um, which is also the path to Delhi, uh, into Lahore's colonial center. Um, where for less than two kilometers, it goes underground. Um, it enters a kind of shallow tunnel uh, below the historic Mall Road um, before ascending again to follow Multan Road um, towards the southern frontiers of Lahore's um, expanding sprawl. So construction on this uh, line began in 2015 and the Orange Line was finally open to the public in, I think October, 2020, but Raza might be able to um, uh, to correct me on that. Um, so it is, is, it's fairly new. It hasn't kind of embedded itself in Lahore's life in the same way that um, uh, the Delhi Metro has, um, but you know, there's uh, lots to explore around its construction and um, its, its place within Lahore's broader story of development. So um, I, I guess I wanted to start by inviting Raza to maybe give us a little bit of this um, context around where the Orange Line sits in terms of Lahore's urban development and its connection to urban politics, um, urban aesthetics, and so on. So Raza, I don't know if you want to. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Chris. Uh, you can hear me, right? Okay. Yep. Yeah, so well, um, I'll start with thanking, uh, you know, Shandana, uh, Thomas, Ali, and everyone who's organized this uh, really interesting discussion. And because I've uh, authored a book on Delhi as well, so what I was hearing was extremely interesting in terms of both mobility and so many other questions that were raised. Uh, and uh, I look forward to reading your book, uh, Rashmi. Um, I, uh, just as a very quick uh, context, I mean, I think uh, the, um, I would like to start with the project of colonial modernity that Lahore has experienced and witnessed uh, uh, over the centuries. I mean, the original city, which was the walled, now the walled or the old city, uh, the British uh, era Lahore uh, tried to move out of that and, and in a way created a new, reimagined a new Lahore, which was outside that particular city that we knew uh, prior to the British, uh, you know, intervention. And uh, that process has continued uh, unhindered in a way. And uh, I mean, Orange Line, of course, the Metro is the more, more recent uh, manifestation of that drive. Uh, but, you know, there have been many uh, occasions in the recent history, I mean, in the early years of the, after the independence, uh, the whole modernization and upgradation of laws, infrastructure, uh, remained a, a dominant theme with the city planners and administrators, who mostly happened to be civil servants and that too trained under the British Raj uh, through the steel frame uh, of Indian civil service. And their, uh, their expansion uh, uh, of Lahore, of course, came at a cost. I mean, it, it was not too different from what the Brits uh, did uh, with the wall city, where they pushed out people and, uh, and uh, thereby ignoring heritage and removing and raising a lot of uh, what we would call, uh, you know, people's architecture or, or people's monuments. So we have lots of kings and queens and nobility and their monuments still in relatively okay shape. I mean, of course, there's much to be done there in terms of conservation, etc. But we rarely come across the uh, how the artisans, the working people, the peasants, uh, the workers lived, uh, what were their homes like, what were their neighborhoods like, because all of that has been erased. And in what you have in the walled city today is actually uh, all the older uh, remnants and, and the ruins uh, have been uh, 
converted into shopping plazas, markets, uh, commercial areas. In fact, now uh, the wall city is more of a inner city commerce uh, hub rather than a place where people actually live and interact. I mean, there are very few parts of the wall city where you where you have proper neighborhood. It's been converted and commercialized beyond uh, uh, belief, actually. Um, and, um, you know, in the recent uh, years and uh, since the 1980s, uh, the former prime minister of Pakistan, Nawaz Sharif, and later his brother, Shabazz Sharif, who were these two Lahori politicians. And, and, and mind you, Lahore is, uh, is, the, is not only the provincial capital of the Punjab province, uh, of Pakistan, but it's also a seat of power uh, because the Punjab province dominates the country's uh, politics, its uh, economic policy, uh, its uh, directions all over. And so uh, there were these, uh, I mean, there are these extremely powerful figures who in the last four decades or so, or so have pushed that, that particular infrastructure upgradation uh, spree or drive uh, to a new, to a totally different level. So I heard many a time this uh, this term world class, quote unquote, being cited in the earlier part of our, uh, of this colloquium. And uh, you know, so a lot of infrastructure up upgradation of Lahore is now referred to as world class. You know, whether it's the the highways, the overhead bridges, the underpasses, the ring roads, or all of it, and not not to. Uh, dissimilar from Beijing or or, uh, or Bangkok in that uh, sense, uh, but what has that that uh, cost? Uh, you know that particular model of development. I mean, I can say a lot, but in short, what has happened is that um, I'm sure many of you have noticed um, in the news cycle in the recent years that you know Lahore and Delhi um, are now world's most polluted cities. You know, with smog levels. Uh, absolutely dangerous for human, uh, uh, I, mean, I mean, for humans uh, to, to live in. And uh, that's a current crisis that Lahore is also undergoing. And it's partly linked to this uh, whole uh, upgradation infrastructure obsessed model of development. And uh, prior to the, uh, to the building of uh, Metro, I mean, there were two particular moments that I would like to cite. And I don't know if there's, if Shandana, you have the slides and you can play uh, those. So the first uh, particular moment was that, you know, Nawaz Sharif was the prime minister in the 90s twice. And so this is the Shalimar Gardens, you know, a, a much coveted Mughal monument uh, built in the 17th century. And, uh, uh, you know, in 1999, uh, the, uh, the then uh, prime minister and the chief minister, they were expanding the Grand Trunk Road, what Chris just mentioned, again, a very important. And uh, in that process, they actually destroyed, nearly destroyed two hydraulic systems, which were built in the mid middle uh, of 17th century. And UNESCO was then uh, kind of forced to place this monument on uh, the dangerous uh, sites uh, or, or endangered sites in 1999 and 2000. Later, this was uh, removed, of course, because the government of the Punjab and Pakistan assured UNESCO that they had taken adequate steps. But, you know, two hydraulic systems uh, were destroyed in that particular expansion. And the third one was linked to the orange line, which I'll just come to later. The other moment was then later, nearly uh, in in the 2006 or so. So this is a canal which is kind of a a, a very important site, both of uh, heritage as well as uh, uh, you know culture, as we call it, because it is a 37. A miles long canal that runs through Lahore and is also uh, very green. It gives the, the particular green space in terms of urban planning and urban ecology. And it is also a free swimming pool. <laughs> so, you know, miles and miles long for historically, I mean, there, there are many of photographs and essays if you were to Google where people have sort of mass swimming pool available. Of course, now it's also extremely polluted. 
And uh, uh, so after many expansions, you can see on the on the both sides of this picture that this uh, road has been widened and rewidened and rewidened with more and more ex expressway lanes and underpasses. So in 2006, the civil society activists went to the court and and they uh, and the court earlier had, had also taken a suo moto notice on its own uh, to stop the felling of these trees. There were about thousands of trees and some of them were uh, hundreds of years old. I mean, planted uh, either in the British era, uh, mostly, and uh, or some even before. And, um, and the court said, OK, uh, no more expansion. What you've done uh, is, is allowed. And they called it, uh, interestingly, they declared this site as a heritage park. Uh, you know, in a court order, and uh, they invoke the doctrine of public trust. So there's a lot of uh, legal, uh, you know, the intersection with law and, and its evolution, both in terms of international law and uh, domestic uh, sort of jurisprudence's ev evolution that has taken place alongside this uh, rush for modernity. And um, uh, if you go next uh, slide, Shanana, so maybe we can then, so here's the orange line, which was the third moment that uh, Chris would talk about. And uh, it orange line as, uh, you know, uh, was started in 2015 and it were, uh, you know, more than 25 uh, uh, monuments and historical sites and places of worship uh, were affected by, uh, this particular uh, project, uh, and and once again there was a court case. So what Chris mentioned that you know from 2015 to 2020, nearly for two, almost two years, the court had had uh, uh, passed an injunction that it could not be built. Uh, this uh, uh, um, that this uh, project had to be halted, and there were uh, you know uh, three particular rights uh, which were. Uh, invoked at that time, and you know they they uh, derive. I mean, I mean, they derive from the canons of international law. You know, the freedom of uh, artistic creativity, uh, the right uh, to access uh, uh, to accessing cultural heritage, and the respect for cultural diversity. So, all these three particular doctrines were invoked uh, at that particular time. Uh, but then ultimately the court gave in, uh, given the imperative of having a public transport system, not unlike Delhi. And uh, it's uh, one segment or one particular line, I think seven or eight, eight kilometers long is now functional. And of course it has had a major impact on mobility. Uh, more than 250,000 uh, people travel on this. And prior to this was also a metro bus project, which was again, a rapid uh, transport network, uh, which again underwent similar concerns, both environmental, ecological, uh, linked to cultural diversity, and of course the law. So I'll stop here, Chris, and I would like you to, uh, uh, you know, take over and uh, talk about the orange line and and what you observe through your field work and and the various walks. Yeah, thanks, Raza. Uh, yeah, I'll just maybe speak for a little bit about my own interest in in the orange line, um, and it is actually through the debates that Raza is mentioning around heritage that I. Um, uh, first started thinking about this piece of infrastructure. So I'm, I'm a historian by training, um, but someone with an interest in the public life of history, right? The public life of the past. And so my work in Pakistan has been grappling with this question of what history or what heritage means uh, in a place, in a country, you know, formed uh, out of two partitions in 1947 and 71, and which is premised in some important ways um, on a rupture from the past, right? On a break from longer histories of, of Muslim life in South Asia um, as part of a kind of pursuit of, uh, of a new society, a new type of state, um, what Faisal Devji calls the Muslim Zion, right? Um, and this is obviously a, a gesture and uh, Ali Kazmi here has done really important work to kind of problematize those notions and show these longer histories that have shaped um, uh, Pakistan. But that kind of, uh, uncertain relationship to the past or this contested relationship to the past has been really um, interesting to me. So the orange line, um, the fact that it was due to, to pass very closely by and in, in some cases potentially compromise these heritage uh, sites that Raza has mentioned, created this small but influential movement that protested its construction, or at least we're demanding a change in the route, right? It was called Rasta Badlo, 
um, ch change the route. And this was my entry point, this particular movement, which was associated with the Lahore um, uh, Conservation Society um, and the questions it raised about infrastructure, class, identity, history, the responsibility of the state um, to history, to its people. And maybe I'll say a little bit more about this later. Um, but during my time in Lahore and specifically in 2018 and 19, I, be, I also was drawn to the emerging metro system itself, right? This 27 kilometer long construction site, um, the kind of rumble of its machinery, the flurry of activity that was enlisting um, a, a huge number of Pakistani laborers, but also visiting Chinese technicians and advisors. And um, Orange Line, the Orange Line, I guess in the same way that the Delhi Metro was, uh, funded by Japanese soft loans, the Orange Line is being funded by Chinese soft loans. And it's in the context of the broader, um, massive China-Pakistan economic corridor, right, which is this huge infrastructural development project that's taking place. Um, but it's technically not part of this initiative. Um, Shabazz Sharif, uh, who oversaw the the project's advent as, as Punjab chief minister, described the Orange Line as a great gift. Right, um, to the people of Lahore, uh, presented generously by the leaders of China, right? So framed as a gift, um, the line invites gratitude, it invites uh, appreciation, the thrill of being favored, um, but obviously um, it also raises the question of, of, of hidden obligations. Right? And, and I think the future of Canada, uh, China's Canada, um, speaking of <laughs> China's vast investment and technical assistance in Pakistan are yet to be seen. Um, this is another story. Um, but in February, 2018, I was walking down Mall Road um, after a day in the archives. It was kind of the early evening time. And I ran up against a massive construction site at GPO Chalk, right, which is um, on the mall road. It's where I mentioned the metro dips underground. Um, and the, the, the construction, the contractors used a cut and cover method here, right? So they, they rather than burrowing a, a tunnel underground, they dig down, lay the track and cover it up again, right? Uh, so here at the very center of the mall road, this kind of picturesque heart of Lahore, you have this dramatic scene of steel and mud and piles of construction materials and huge kind of gashes into the ground. Uh, and as you can imagine, this is back traffic up for, um, for kind of miles and they were kind of directed on a detour around the site. Um, I worried for a moment that as a pedestrian, I would also have to kind of follow this detour and I was a little worried about it, but I soon noticed that people were calmly walking across the country, uh, the, entering the construction site and walking across it, right? Um, and so I followed their route uh, I was completely ignored by the uninterested passing laborers, uh, surrounded by kind of sparks and moving machinery. Um, and I joined as the kind of people in front of me jumped over a gaping hole uh, to return to the sidewalk on the other side. Right? And so there was an experience that got me thinking about the aesthetics of construction, the, the way uh, in which construction orients one's sense of, of, of the world in a place like Lahore, where construction is kind of constantly happening, but also the obduracy of certain urban rhythms, right? The cool confidence of that pedestrian who continues to walk across the con construction site uh, on their way. Um, so this prompted in me, I guess, uh, this, uh, this ambition to, to walk the length of the construction site. And I did this in uh, over a period of walks in, in 2019. I had the kind of privilege of being in Lahore for an extended period that time. Uh, and I followed the orange line from its, um, you know, end point and, and that very interesting space, which Rashmi mentioned, um, where the kind of station meets the, the, the rural urban kind of um, encounter is, is, is taking place. Um, and so I use the orange line as this kind of experiment in seeing the city differently, to see the new geography that was being produced um, by the contentious mega, mega project. And um, Rashmi in her book talks about the interface between the metro and the city, the idea that it is designed, as you mentioned, as a kind of standalone artifact, but it is designed to shape the city, but also is shaped by it. And I think even though I was walking this route before the orange line was open, right? Construction was still taking place. Um, even at this stage before trains were running, much of the, the kind of viaduct had been integrated into the everyday rhythms of, of, of the urban environment. So these huge supporting columns, which you kind of got a glimpse of in Raza's uh, images, 
provide these ample space for uh, pasting posters and advertisements at street level, right? And more than once I'd seen a kind of barber shop set up kind of with the mirror balanced on the column, uh, kind of integrating that, uh, that piece of construction into, uh, into everyday life. And these islands under the viaduct um, had actually ended up in creating kind of accidental public spaces, right? Spaces for sociality, for trade, um, paint sellers at Lakshmi Chalk, cover for a furniture market at Samnabad, um, a cluster of Ludo players uh, near Samnabad. Um, and some of these islands even had young gardens or, or small trees, though a lot of it was covered in kind of um, layers of dust because the, the space is hidden from the sky by the viaduct. So these forms of the column of the islands and then the way they're being integrated in urban uh, life contrasted with the debris that was also left by the construction. Um, this gesture of the kind of cut or the carve of construction because the root of construction was, was littered with these old overpass walkways which had been sliced uh, in half and left by the roadside around the stations which were um, because of the entranceways needed uh, much greater space surrounding buildings were cut directly into to make space for them. Um, and so you have these kind of polished glass, freshly painted station entrances around buildings that had been kind of cut open and left as if, um, um, at least when I was walking, left in, in place as this kind of um, bombed out structure almost, right? And this space around the Anarkali Lake Road station, which is one of the central stations of the line um, and was perhaps the most controversial, um, here because it was related to building that cut and cover tunnel, um, an entire neighborhood had been cut through and its residents given a uh, little notice of their eviction, little compensation for their trouble. Uh, and I, when I walked that section in 2019, the houses cut in half still remained and you could see kind of furniture balanced outside of the, the walls of these, these homes and upper story rooms. And um, so colleagues, uh, Amar Maksud and Fiza Sajad have done some really important ethnographic work around the families that were um, uh, affected by this instance of displacement and on, on kind of surviving dispossession as um, uh, working class subjects in Lahore. And I'd really kind of uh, recommend their, their work. So just to return then uh, to the question of heritage and kind of tie into some of these questions that the, the broader workshop series uh, is posing for us. Um, the line was not scheduled to destroy or run through any historic buildings. Um, but the worry was that the construction would uh, destabilize the heritage structure, right? That the train um, would be running too close, that it would affect uh, a particular building. Or um, that the completed metro might spoil some of these uh, views and threaten the kind of cultural landscape of the city. And so um, Raz already mentioned Shalimar Bag, and that was also a kind of um, uh, point of contention that you would, instead of having this pleasure garden, you would have a metro kind of rattling by every few minutes. Um, and so activists were organizing around a number of, uh, I think 11 historic sites were part of that legal challenge. Um, and uh, this movement was um, criticized at the time for reflecting elite views of, of what is culturally valuable, right? Foregrounding these questions of heritage over um, human lives and well-being, the necessity of a better public transport provision in, in one of Pakistan's largest cities. But I don't think the issue is quite so clear cut um, in the sense that that uh, alliance of citizens groups which brought the legal challenge about the construction of the metro was consistently centering the relationship between the conservation of heritage and the welfare of communities. Um, and I can maybe say a little bit about that um, more later, but this, this, this notion that um, heritage is something that constitutes communities rather than is there simply for their consumption or, or, or entertainment. Um, and in, in that sense, and I can maybe wrap up with a, an anecdote, which I first encountered in fieldwork, others might have um, also heard it. Uh, and the anthropologist Tim Cooper has, has actually written a, a recent article on this notion of new heritage that it anticipates. But the scene is this, the, it's Punjab's chief minister, then chief minister Shabazz Sharif in his office. He's pounding his desk, he's cursing his advisors, and he's infuriated by these ongoing protests um, of heritage campaigners and the threat they're posing to this kind of uh, project of modernity of development, the Orange Line. He says, or he's recorded to have said, what are these guys going on about 11 historic sites? We will make hundreds of historic sites. The Chinese will help us. China is very good at it, right? So for those who recite this story, 
the corruption of this kind of developmental mindset is um, represented by Sharif is, is complete. So heritage is just this other form of commodity entertainment that could be mass produced and such uh, integrated in this in, in this project. So again, I think this um, resonates with some of the themes of, of the workshop. It introduces some binaries that I think um, are worth thinking through and which I think Rajmi's work has really um, encouraged us to challenge in terms of that kind of lived experience of Metro and, and the possibilities that are there um, within it and maybe are difficult to see at this early stage of construction still. Um, uh, Raza, I, I don't know if you want to say a little bit about one of these monuments that was uh, at the center of these protests, which was the, the Mughal Gateway Choburji. Um, I, I'll, I'll leave it to you if you want to go into that or we can maybe even open up the discussion further, but please. Um, well, thank you, Chris. I mean, uh, what you said was so fascinating that I thought that maybe I'll just quickly, I wanted to say more, but maybe Shandana, if you can play the slides for uh, Chaburji, and I just wanted to, so at the, uh, you know, the movement that Chris was re referring to, and maybe go to the next one. So this is a, 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 a public monument, we know, uh, unlike most uh, other Mughal monuments, it's uh, not ticketed, it does not really have a boundary, it does not have, it, it's very much a lived and uh, ever changing and ever evolving mo monument. And uh, so it was uh, actually, um, once again, uh, built in, uh, in the latter part of 17th century. I mean, you know, there's a, there's a lot of mythology around this that the two Mughal princesses uh, appeared, appeared to have ordered its construction. It was just a gateway to a huge garden that existed at that time outside the walled society, which was the urban space in, uh, in Lahore. And, uh, you know, um, Emperor Shah Jahan's daughter, Jahanara, uh, act, uh, is is cited in one of the I mean indirectly again as the lady of the age or something and and it is also referred to the um, later Mughal emperor Aurangzeb's uh, daughter who uh, not only expanded it uh, so uh, but also this was her rendezvous uh, point uh, uh, for meeting. Uh, with her lovers uh, sac sacredly, all of this is folklore, of course. Uh, there's no rigorous uh, evidence uh, available. But over the uh, over the you know different stages of history, the monument has changed shapes and has always been uh, informed and um, you know uh, transformed by the state technologies and by the by the way state has interacted with the uh, living heritage. So uh, next one, Shandana, if you can move on to. Uh, so this is uh, uh, its restoration. Uh, I think uh, uh, prior to uh, the orange line. Uh, so it's, it's, it's always been undergoing because I'm from Lahore. So, uh, I mean, it's one of the most visible, it's now located on a roundabout. I mean, prior to the uh, start of Orange Line, you would uh, turn around it and, and there were all these trees and uh, thickly sort of uh, forested trees, which later I remember as a child, one day they started chopping all the trees and creating a British style lawn. Uh, with green grass, uh, et cetera. And you can see that, that the, here the grass has been planted, I think in the, in, in the springtime. Next slide. And, and uh, uh, so, and then there, there, there are all sorts of uh, architectural features within uh, this monument, which make it very unique because it is it brings in both uh, the Mughal and the pre-Mughal uh, intake as well as uh, Timurid styles. Uh, in its not only its, in its construction, but in the kind of mosaic uh, work that has been created. So it's a, in a way, it's a lot of. Uh, uh, um, I mean, it's both a tribute to the pre-Mughal era as well as a um, sort of demonstration of the splendor of the Mughals. Uh, next uh, slide, and and then you know uh, also we saw in the 1980s and 90s, you know, when the uh, the militant organization Jamaat ud Dawa which is uh, uh, another name for lashkar e uh, always uh, a, a jihadist organization uh, with the mission to liberate Kashmir from India. So, uh, and because it had some level of state backing, so uh, they took over uh, the monument for weeks and weeks with their posters and jihad announcements and their headquarters is right behind 
uh, this monument, you know, in a mosque, and that's where they've been operating from. And uh, next slide, and then you uh, you can also see other posters and advertisements all the time. So this was a very much a. I mean, I even remember with the you know weddings and public. Uh, uh, sort of uh, gatherings and even private gatherings around this this monument. So in, in truly a, a, a unique uh, um, site of, uh, you know, communal uh, and public uh, open access sort of uh, site. And, and Orange Line, the resistance, you know, the, the real uh, concern uh, was that, you know, uh, because Orange Line was uh, uh, passing so closely to this monument and the law says that you cannot have a, um, a either a road or a, or a construction in the 200 uh, meters uh, distance. Next one. And so that's when the, the protests, you know, so in a way, Chiburji became this, uh, uh, also this, this uh, um, visual representation of uh, the uh, public movement against uh, uh, the orange line. So this is Basti Bajao train kahi or chalao. Let this neighborhood and let let this public site remain and uh, uh, take the train somewhere else. Next one, and so there are few posters and then I'll end. Rasta Badlo, what Chris mentioned earlier. So this was a popular uh, sort of um, uh, slogan of the activists, and you can see when the bulldozers, etc., the machinery was there. That was a a common sort of cry at that time. Next, Shandana, and then we can sort of conclude. And so here are, and this is outside Shalimar Gardens, are the ones I sh uh, showed you with this uh, sort of um, development, not destruction, uh, you know, speak up to save uh, Lahore and save the heritage. Next, and uh, uh, another one outside Chaburji, this is uh, the same kind of, uh, our history is not for sale. So, so in a way, this particular movement was informing uh, a, a, a lot of. Uh, I would say it has it has altered the public consciousness about uh, issues related to infrastructure, uh, what heritage means, uh, what uh, what shared spaces mean, and you know, because this orange line was a project, a, a what uh, Chris mentioned as a gift, the Chinese gift to Pakistanis, brought to. Uh, Lahore and Pakistan by the Sharif family who were then in power, the uh, the uh, opposition party, which is now in power, um, uh, you know, created this entire narrative about how bad infrastructure was and how large scale mega projects were terrible uh, for ecology and there were other things to be uh, focused upon. So in a way, uh, this movement, uh, the civil society uh, activism, plus the political resistance to it, and plus the judicial uh, sort of uh, delay uh, has actually generated a debate uh, within Pakistan on what does large infrastructure projects me mean and what even, uh, what uh, how far uh, should the modernity project be espoused? Uh, maybe next one, and then, we, uh, then I can, yes, so there's, there's another image. And his uh, Shabazz Sharif, who uh, inaugurated uh, the Orange Line, which was not functional, but because he was leaving uh, his office, so he wanted to uh, inaugurate and get all the political mileage that he could from the large-scale uh, infrastructure project. Okay, maybe you, you can understand it because it just goes on and on. So quickly, I'll just wrap it up. I mean, I think uh, uh, what uh, in I mean to, for me the the most interesting um, part uh, of of this uh, particular uh, you know resistance to um, a, you know both for conservation of heritage and protection of public spaces and and, and, and heritage has actually opened up a possibility uh, to challenge some of the uh, key characteristics of modernization, which sadly has pervaded as a developmental model since the 1950s, while other parts of the world, notably in Latin America and elsewhere, have moved on from that modernization, uh, you know, theory or, or whatever, Pakistan remains pretty much wedded to it. And the Washington consensus, you know, Pakistan is going into, I think, the 25th or 26th. I mean, I'm, I lose the numbers uh, loan. 
uh, uh, agreement with the IMF and is uh, blindly sort of um, following all the conditions that they that they are setting, uh, whether uh, whether they're going to cause public difficulty or not. Uh, but you know this kind of uh, political uh, challenge and uh, activism uh, has uh, generated some kind of a future possibility uh, where uh, you know heritage where heritage becomes a uh, an entry point for a much larger uh, political and uh, um, cultural debate in the country. I'll stop here, please. Sure. Thanks, Raza. And I think we should probably open it up to questions. I, I might just kind of start in response to what Raza is saying, and I'd be interested to hear his thoughts and also of the other Lahori's on the call about, I mean, that's quite an optimistic reading, Raza, about what that heritage campaign has done. And I wonder if there's also a way to think of it as having an unintended consequence in the sense that Tuburji has been restored, but it's also been fenced off by this like, six foot fence that is hard to, you know, I had a friend of mine who lives near there, Amber Binabad has said that it's been cleaned up for viewership from the Metro. This is also partially why I asked Rajmi about that idea of spectatorship, that it's it's been restored and gated off. So it's gonna be appreciated from the Metro rather than from on the ground as it used to be. So there is also like this question of are our heritage arguments simply about conservation protection or are they about the relationships? Um, that are forged between people in the past in different ways. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I don't know if we decided who is gonna, shall I read out the questions as well, Ali, or do you want to? Yeah, sure. Um, so Ali's asked a, a question. Um, what do you think about the new aesthetics of seeing? So this is kind of related to Darshan. Darshaning, Darshaning, um, that the Orange Line has introduced. One of the key members associated with the project justified the elevated train system, not just because it would be, uh, it was more affordable to build, but also because it would provide a more pleasing view to commuters as they pass by Shalimar Gardens, okay? Um, in the same way, commuters will be able to pay respect to Mojdarya's shrine while raiding the train, although for some devotees, it will be akin to looking down upon the shrine. Um, yeah, that's really interesting, Ali, and, and um, Kind of related, I guess, to, to what I was saying about how that logic of entertainment and um, spectatorship is embedded into the system. Um, Raza, I don't know if you want to respond to any of that. Or... Uh, <laughs> not really. Go ahead, Chris. I mean, this yeah. is a <laughs> complex one. I mean, uh, all I all I want to say is, of course, you know, the 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 underground versus elevated. I mean, again this was a big debate i mean that went on for almost years even before the project was launched and um, and and uh, as you as you rightly say the maj darya shrine which was uh, which was time and again cited as an endangered uh, sort of four, i don't know 500 year old monument uh, being affected by the orange line so it's uh, again um, uh, something which has been uh, uh, entered into public debate. I mean, I, I don't really have a clear cut view or an answer to it, but I think uh, the very fact that these questions were raised and are still being discussed because Orange Line will be expanded. I mean, or, I mean, the Metro system would be expanded. I mean, uh, that's for sure. I mean, that's how it's going, but uh, I mean, uh, would it, uh, would the next phase uh, take into account uh, some of the earlier lessons uh, from this experience and, and from urbanization and uh, public transport models or not remains a moot point. Thanks, Raza. Yeah, Ali, I, I think, um, you know, I, my experience of the Orange Line is limited to its construction thanks to COVID. So um, I'm not really able to speak about uh, how people have been experiencing it, um, but hopefully in future, um, future research. Um, any other questions that people would like to raise? Uh, Thomas is asking about plans for further expansion. So there, there is, I believe, two more routes uh, planned at the moment. Um, beyond that, I'm not sure. So it's not quite of the same scale as, as Delhi, but, um, but, but growing. Yeah, Rashmi. Um, this is very interesting to hear both of you speak about the orange line. And it's um, of course it's very exciting. And I yeah, I wish I could go there too and check it out. 
Um, but yeah, I was just it, hearing you talk about this. It was making me think of, um, you know, there were, there was a similar case with the Qutb Minar in Delhi where the, the yellow line was going to block it. And in that case, the Delhi Urban Arts Commission, they got together, they're like a non-government affiliated, um, like an NGO, and they, you know, protested and they were protesting around many different heritage sites, but this was the one that the DMRC did listen to their arguments and they did change the course of the line actually so that the Kutub Minar wouldn't be obstructed. Um, so I wanted to ask, are there, um, I mean, I was interested to see the photographs that Reza had put up of the um, protesters because that's not something that we saw in Delhi in terms of heritage, but are there, sort of government or non-government agencies that are also coalescing around these debates about heritage or is it actually coming from you know just from interested uh just like regular people who are not part of organizations go ahead Reza. you okay part yeah, of these, so <laughs> so in uh, um, uh, rashmi i think i mentioned uh, the canal widening project and when uh, Canal was also declared as a heritage park. I mean, not that it is that that particular verdict has been fully or partially implemented. So there was a movement which was called Lahore Bajao Tariq, uh, Save Lahore uh, movement. So that's a loose coalition of a number of associations uh, comprising non-governmental bodies. Uh, you know. Uh, students, uh, architects, urban planners, uh, you know, there's a, there's a, a, a you know, um, uh, workers part, uh, groups. <laughs> so it's a, it's a, it's a really broad coalition and that has been uh, active and it has had some very prominent lawyers are part of that coalition too. So they have been time and again, uh, seeking re redress from from the courts, and so in uh, in early two thousands, uh, up to Orange Line, up up to twenty eighteen, uh, when the court finally allowed uh, the the project to be completed, uh, they have been pretty active. But I think a lot of students have been uh, part of this um, movement, especially in the latter uh, phase of activism vis-a-vis uh, -vis Orange Line. And finally, I think the other interesting part is that, as, as I mentioned earlier, the main opposition party, uh, uh, Pakistan Tehreek and South Pakistan Justice Party in, in uh, translation, which now rules Pakistan. I mean, its workers and its supporters have been the most avid, uh, you know, um, haters of the orange line because it was being done by the other party, which was more popular, you know, because it was uh, the Sharifs, uh, interestingly, if I may, Chris and I know I don't uh, and and please stop me when I'm uh, going to uh, talking too much you know so the the Sharifs have been since the 80s have also been uh, you know uh, cited as Mughals you know in uh, as a as a pejorative term you know that they behave like Mughal emperors they want to build these big motorways they want to big uh, build this these orange line trains and uh, and so it's it's commonly referred to and then you know they're they're fond of big homes and fancy cars and really lavish meals so all of that fits and lavish weddings so all of that fits into that Mughal uh, kind of uh, uh, stereotyping in the 21st century. So, so a lot of uh, people who don't vote for them or, or who resist them politically were also part of this, this activist bandwagon. You know, of course, momentarily for purely political reasons. And that's why this was a very interesting moment. And of course, they ended up replicating this in other parts of the country where they were... Uh, where the current ruling party uh, was ruling in a province and they had a mass uh, transit uh, project uh, on, on the similar lines, uh, like, like in Lahore, but not Metro. Uh, so, so in a way, this is a pretty uh, um, loose and wide and uh, coalition that has the potential to grow bigger. Yeah, there were some interesting alliances, which included um, civil society activists you know, mm -hmm. protesting alongside Jama um yeah. members in Jaburji against the construction, you know, the, the um, but I think um, one of the reason that there was kind of debates around this was, again, that you had um, instances of uh, kind of LDA, um, lower development authority officials putting spray painting X's on people's doors. 
um, to indicate that the building was going to be demolished without people being, um, uh, you know, notified with any sort of, um, you know, uh, warning. And the, the X was the warning, essentially. And there was a, a lot of debate around why the protests were around heritage rather than um, these sorts of displacements. Um, I also wanted to mention that the, they did succeed in, like the, the line was moved a little bit, but just by kind of kind of to curve around Shalimar um, Gardens or to kind of curve around Taburji. So um, yeah, there's kind of an interesting history there. Um, uh, Shubangni has asked about, um, oh, sorry, Shandana first asked about uh, what the orange line might mean in terms of mobility for people, um, similar to what Rashmi has mentioned about um, connecting hinterlands with the main city. Um, and then Shubangni, maybe we can take these two together um, to speak about uh, the navigation of the construction and completed metro sites by people. So are there similarities or differences in the class-based perceptions of the project and how different people envision use and inclusion of the metro in their lives? So again, um, because the, the, the opening of the metro is fairly recent uh, and because COVID has disrupted all of my kind of travel to, to Pakistan in recent years, I can't really speak about um, how people have been experiencing the, the, the metro itself. Um, I can say that almost every person that I spoke to along the GT road and along Motan road um, was excited about the metro and they were, um, they were pleased that it was being built. They were um, not even particularly annoyed about the construction. So I think a lot of those um, uh, points raised uh, earlier um, around the Delhi context by Rashmi and, and the kind of symbolic potential of, of what, the, what, this, what this infrastructure meant, um, uh, you know, relate here and is again something that the Sharifs benefited from in terms of taking the mantle of that um, progressive narrative. Um, uh, Gwendolyn's adding that the activism of the civil society not only addressed heritage, but also the eviction of poor neighborhoods. Yes, I, I, um, maybe I was kind of being a bit too simplistic. The, the legal order was uh, specifically based around heritage as um, because that, that legal protection system was more powerful than the rights protecting individual people, but it did also criticize the, um, the, the project in general for its kind of um, anti-poor perspective and it's kind of uh, uh, the eviction of poor neighborhoods. Um, Raza, I don't know if you want to speak a little bit, maybe if you have a sense more of um, how the orange line is being embedded in everyday life um, or how the kind of class perceptions or conceptions come into um, the use of the metro. So I think, uh, uh, I mean, I think it's it's pretty mixed in the sense that, uh, um, you know, it is a, a fairly multi-class uh, you know base that uh, uses the metro on a daily basis i mean it, it includes working people from outside lahore i mean lahore has been expanding and expanding and uh, but it has increased uh, mobility both the metro bus system uh, built and completed in 2013 uh, so yeah and uh, and the metro uh, the orange line uh, have enabled, uh, I mean, at least uh, three to three to four hundred thousand people uh, entering in Lahore and leaving Lahore for work for employment. So, in that particular sense, it's been a great uh, facilitator. Uh, but I think it's also a simple. So, so you know, one thing that I wanted to mention, and I was very wary of time, that during uh, 2021 we had uh, in Pakistan a new religious group uh, called Tehreek-e labbaik -e pakistan TLP, uh, you know, which has been organized around the issue of blasphemy and the honor of Prophet Muhammad, uh, you know, and responding to what they call uh, the, the Islamophobic uh, currents in the West. I mean, so they, uh, interestingly, I think they protested uh, two or three times in Lahore, and their target was always the various entry points and the installations around the orange line. So there, there, there are quite a few images where they have actually vandalized uh, the escalators, what uh, Rashmi was mentioning about people going for joy rides or, 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 the, or the, the, uh, the elevators um, or other symbols. 
So either they take it as a as a kind of state uh, or a, or a government symbol. So TLP comprises um, uh, uh, of, of working poor, of unemployed youth. It is not just a a party of madrasa or Islamist students, but it actually has a much wider social base. And for them, this has been a more of a middle class. Uh, or a um, uh, or a symbol to be attacked um, uh, in, in while asserting their own sense of deprivation and exclusion from political and economic life. So, so it is it is it is um, uh, quite mixed in that particular sense. I hope I've answered this. <laughs> yeah, it's really interesting. Rather, thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions or comments? I just wanted to respond to Thomas as well. I mean, about the expansion plans. Yes, I mean, Chris already mentioned that there are two more, at least two more lines and perhaps more. But what has happened is that it is this project has been uh, immensely politicized. So it is now uh, viewed as a, as a, uh, you know, goody uh, political uh, act of political patronage by by one political party which is very popular in the Punjab so so it is only if they are going to come into power that the other phases are likely to be expanded because the others are very wary of uh, of building on it because they think that invariably uh, that particular political party which initiated this infrastructure project would benefit so there's a whole whole um uh, you know dynamic of clientelism and uh, uh, political patronage around this infrastructure project i mean it is it is a, that's something that uh, you know i really haven't uh, uh, i mean i i couldn't touch uh, for the uh, you know paucity of time and also i wanted to be focused but there's this whole uh, representation of uh, the orange line as a as a political intervention uh, to garner votes and to consolidate uh, uh, the uh, the uh, Pakistan Muslim League's uh, support base, so so the expansion is very much subject to political uh, dynamics and who actually comes into power. It's not something which is uh, where there's a consensus on expanding the public transport, unlike perhaps Delhi or other parts of the world where it is kind of viewed as a public good, and all political parties or or segments come together in promoting that. Yeah, so Ali's question is right. Uh, so uh, Ali, you've been raising these most difficult questions. I mean, so <laughs> why, maybe Chris, why don't you talk about no. this, this lack of consensus? No, I, I mean, I think I think you've kind of suggested the politicized nature. Um, stalls yeah. I, I don't know, it would be interesting to, to hear from Rashmi if there was ever an element of that in Delhi, if it was kind of associated yeah. with a particular. Yeah, why not? You know, it's it's very interesting to hear this the situation in Lahore. I mean, in Delhi, you know, one of the um, part of the early action plan was, and this is in reports that I've read that are available to the public of the DMRCs, um, or most of them, anyways. They had a whole plan. They said we cannot have any negative press. <laughs> they, I mean, they, you know, they didn't control the press, but they informally. Um, you know, had only positive stories, many positive stories. And of course, there were many people who wanted to write positive stories, but they also turned stories that could be negative into positive. Uh, people working at especially Times of India and Hindustan Times. So there was this almost like a, you know, implicit agreement that, you know, this was going to be seen as a positive. And I think that helped the project, especially early on. Um, and so they took the PR campaign very seriously. And, you know, they have, like many of these corporations have, obviously, a big PR wing. And that's uh, one of the more important parts of the DMRC. That's uh, really interesting, uh, Rashmi. And uh, so I, I'll quickly respond to Ali's uh, very, uh, I, th I think it's a crucial question in so many ways. Uh, uh, I think part of it has to do with the class um, uh, you know, support uh, 
to this project or opposition. It is, it is very much a reflection of the class uh, uh, politics involved here. So, so most of the uh, opponents of, uh, of Orange Line in Lahore are from the elites or the upper middle class, which, uh, you know, a segment that is very vocal in the public uh, arena and uh, uh, the opinion makers or the supporters of the current ruling party. And they keep on referring to the subsidy, the heavy subsidy that the government has to pay. Uh, it's a white elephant, it's a burden. And uh, in a way, there's also this, uh, this particular um, you know, tension and fear in this in in this uh, gr uh, in these groups of people who think that you know the poor or the low middle classes or the working poor must not be subsidized, right? So at the end of the day, that's how I would uh, view it, uh, and so that's the and in Pakistan, as uh, as Ali would uh, know better than anyone else. Uh, but you know that uh, Pakistan's uh, class structure is such that the narratives and uh, political um, sort of uh, uh, strands are very much manipulated by the elites, uh, uh, and and it's um, unlike India, where there's a there's a sizable and sufficient participation by the middle classes in the political arena. So, I mean, it's, uh, it's very much people who are affluent and privileged who have cars in Lahore, they think this is a burden, it's an eyesore, it's destroying our heritage, look at the, those ugly pillars. And the, you know, they've taken my old Lahore, you'll see a lot of articles saying, bring my old Lahore back. Where are my trees? I want my bag. I want my Lahore. You know, it's a commonly so in English writing in Pakistan is also an elitist pursuit. So people who write in the English newspapers or magazines are often from a, from the one percent or less than one percent, actually 0.01 percent. Once we calculated how many people read and write in, in in English, and you see a lot of opposition in the papers. And while what Chris says in his interactions with uh, across the spectrum that there was a lot of support interestingly for the project okay i think now um uh, it's, it's time to wrap up and we are so delighted that we had this first session on on, on lahore and, and then delhi because in many ways lahore and delhi are like twin cities i always wonder you know it's a Delhi has uh, Red Fort, we have a Hall Fort. Delhi has, uh, you know, um, um, Shahi Masjid, we have Pat Shahi Masjid. Delhi has Ghalib, Lahore has Akbar, right? So, <laughs> and now Delhi has a proper metro and Lahore is is, is catching up. Um, thank you so much, um, uh, Arashmi, Chris, Thomas, and, and Raza for, for joining us. And once again, thank you, uh, Shandana and uh, Shubhangni for organizing this. Um, and, and Stanford Global Studies and Center for South Asian Studies at Stanford for, for uh, uh, sponsoring this event. Um, it was a fantastic uh, discussion and hope you will be following our, uh, uh, you know, uh, the series of lectures that we have planned for, uh, for this semester. Uh, the next one I think will be in, in, in February and we will be um, sending out um, emails to, to all those who, who joined us today. Thank you once again. Thank you. Bye-bye.